Welcome back to the channel. I want to talk about a new paper. It's out now in circulation. This was a preprint. They've made some changes. They fixed it up a bit. They put it out in circulation. This is Martina Patone. Patone and colleagues, the risk of myocarditis after sequential doses of COVID-19 vaccine and SARS-CoV-2 infection by age and sex. And it has a bombshell finding in this paper. It's a long paper. It's complicated. It uses the UK data. These data might even miss some cases of myocarditis. That's for sure. And it chooses to lump people into, you know, men below 40 and men above 40. But we all know, and we'll talk more about men below 40. There's lots of different ages between below 40. I remember it's a lot different being 39 where I am right now and being 16 years old. Okay, that's a pretty different. But it has a bombshell finding in this paper. And that bombshell is this. I'm going to put it up on the screen. There is no doubt about it. You can't dispute it. You can't argue anymore. Some doses of the COVID-19 mRNA vaccine and some specific products in men under 40 have risk of myocarditis post-vaccine that are far greater than the risk of myocarditis post-COVID-19, even among somebody who's never had any COVID-19 shots, okay? Shown on the screen, dose 2 Moderna simply swamps the signal from COVID-19 without any vaccination. Okay, and what's not shown on the screen, what I put here as not reported, because they're not reporting, is what is the risk of myocarditis from COVID-19 for somebody who got one dose? Okay, let me break this down a little bit. The first point. The first point I want to get across is that many people were saying for quite a long period of time, and some of these people claim to be scientists, that the risk of myocarditis from COVID-19 always has to be greater than any single product, any single age, any single dose, any single person. This figure shows conclusively that that is incorrect. I've said always that was incorrect. It was always incorrect. But now I think it's indisputable. They will no longer be able to say that claim. They will have to find some watered down claim. But it is true that the second dose of Moderna when given typically on the 28 day schedule in men under the age of 40 has much, much higher rates of myocarditis than the virus itself, even if you were to meet the virus without any vaccine, which I've never advised anyone to meet it that way, any adult, particularly in 2021. Now, what do we need to know here? One, I think there's an important point to be made that the authors are still binning data in big bins. I see there's some news coverage of this that shows this study by Patone and colleagues is reassuring that it shows that, you know, across the whole population, the risk of COVID-19, myocarditis, and the risk of vaccine, myocarditis, blah, blah, blah. Well, 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 stop right there. We're not talking about across the whole population. You see, as a doctor, I'm able to tell the difference between a 22-year-old man and an 87-year-old woman. I'm able to do that. I'm able to tell that difference. And as long as I'm able to tell the difference between a 22-year-old man and an 87-year-old woman, I shouldn't be looking at myocarditis that lump together 22-year-old men and 87-year-old women. We want to know the risk of myocarditis from every single dose of vaccine and from all the possible ways you get breakthrough. I'm going to talk about that more. For a 22-year-old man and an 87-year-old woman, I have no doubt in my mind that the calculus for an 87-year-old woman is going to favor many, many doses of vaccine because the risk of myocarditis for her is very, very low and the risk of bad outcomes from COVID-19 is very, very high. But there's a lot of questions around young men and how many doses is optimal. Let's talk about that. You can get zero doses, one doses, two doses, three doses, at least in this country so far. Maybe in a few weeks, they're going to say four doses. You can get that many doses as a 22-year-old man. No matter how many doses you get, you will inevitably have a COVID-19 breakthrough. You can get one dose and have a breakthrough. You can get a second dose and have a breakthrough. You can get a third dose and have a breakthrough. And I'm sure that even this fourth dose, we have no clinical trial data. God forbid they have any human data, but you could probably get a fourth dose and still get a breakthrough. We have yet to know. We have never seen these uh, bivalent vaccines yet. So what you need to do when you think about the best path, and really we're already kind of a year late, but imagine hypothetically we're back in time. You have to ask yourself, which has the lowest cumulative risks and the greatest cumulative benefits? Is it zero doses in meeting the virus? And I think it's highly unlikely that to be the case, um, particularly for you know even 35-year-old, 40-year-old men, it's highly unlikely that that's the best path. One dose and then meeting the virus, you have a huge reduction in, in virus-induced myocarditis and you have the minimal um, but real excess myocarditis from the vaccine. And if that first dose goes in, should it be a Pfizer and Moderna? You get two doses, Pfizer, Pfizer, and then breakthrough, or Moderna, Moderna, and then breakthrough. What's that cumulative path of myocarditis? And I think you see here clearly from this study that a boy who is particularly, particularly under the age of 40, this proves if they get the two doses and then the breakthrough, that myocarditis risk is going to be super, super high. And then you can imagine three doses and then breakthrough. 
And you can imagine a whole set of varied scenarios for people who had the virus earlier. They had the virus before they were ever vaccinated. What's their risk benefit? How many doses should they get? They had the virus after one dose. How many additional doses should they get? You know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we can think about it that way. And this is, you know, requires a lot more clinical trial data. It requires a lot more granular data. But I've never seen the commitment from the US CDC and the FDA to do that. And we wrote this about a year ago. We wrote this back in 2021 that the one size fits all approach for vaccine policy runs the risk that there's real safety signals you're ignoring. And I think they have done that repeatedly. Um, this paper refutes the claim that it is impossible for a vaccine in anybody of any age to have more myocarditis than the virus itself. It's clear, dose two Moderna, day 28, men under 40, that is the case. But if you were to just look at men in that high risk group, 18 to 22, I don't know what you'll find. These authors have not, and and as far as I know, they've never broken it down that granular, but they really need to, 18 to 20, 20 to 22. I suspect that you may see that in those little buckets, those are the highest risk age groups, that the risk of myocarditis, excess events per million exposed will be even higher. And the risk in SARS-CoV-2, I don't know, but from their own paper, as you go down in age, that risk of myocarditis plus SARS-CoV-2 appeared to get lower. So I think it might even be lower and the trade-off might even be more unfavorable. We need to do that calculation in every single age bin. The other thing we need to do, we need to have separate breakdown of healthy and you know very well kids. We need to know what's the risk benefit balance in a healthy kid versus a kid who um, has other comorbidities, who's overweight, um, who may have asthma, who may have uh, multiple medical problems. Uh, I think that's important. Now, what is the goal of all of this? The goal of this is vaccines, like any other drug, they ha often have tremendous potential for benefit and they often have real side effects you gotta take seriously. Like any other product, you want to give it as safely as possible. No one is saying that no one should get any, you know, correction, no actual scientist is arguing the strong claim that, you know, no boy should ever get any vaccine back in, you know, January of 2021. I think what the argument is, is that we didn't make a concerted effort in 2021 to figure out the right number of doses. We knew that Moderna had the safety signal. We didn't ban or restrict Moderna's use in men under 40 as Norway did and many other European nations did because they take safety seriously. We didn't think about exemptions for people with natural immunity. We didn't think about exemptions for boosters with people who just had Omicron. And moving to 2022, it's a whole new ball game because now all the risks of virus-induced myocarditis are probably very, very different with these new strains. We don't know and all the risks of continuing boosters are still unknown because the booster is no longer given stacked day 21, day 28. It's given a long time out, which may lower the risk of myocarditis, but playing with the mRNA sequence in the vaccine might alter it either way, lower it or raise it. We don't know. There's even more uncertainty bounds here. Okay. So what it means for the present day, it's very different. What it means for the past is I think it does reflect a failure at the CDC and FDA. I told them that. I wrote op-ed after op-ed. I wrote, you know, substack after substack. We have a piece that I think is really nice with cardiologists, with pediatricians that we published in MedPage today about one-size-fits-all CDC policy where we pointed out that even their own model building likely tipped for second dose for adolescent boys. We pointed out some other things back in the day, even with figures at that time. This paper vindicates a lot of the thinking. It really reflects to me that the CDC didn't take it as seriously as they ought to. The FDA is not taking it as seriously. We talked about the Thailand preprint. People have argued about that even more since um, you know the last few weeks. But one thing remains certain is the main point. Why do you have to look for Thailand to do this research? Why does the United States have to look to Thailand to find out rates of troponin elevation in young men after COVID-19 vaccination? Pfizer had a post-marketing commitment. They still have it. They have the legal requirement to deliver that product. They gave The FDA gave them too much time, and we shouldn't be looking to Thailand to give this information. Why did no U.S. medical center do it? I think it's an important question. So again, we are talking about medical products need to maximize benefits and minimize harms. What the optimal number of doses in the past was, I still don't know. This paper does give, gives you some provocative clues. We really do need to, I think, litigate the past a little bit. We need to figure out what was right so we can learn lessons for the future for the next time. That means these authors need to break down under 40 into every single age bucket they got so that we have a little bit more spread. But going forward, we need to think about the new balance of risks and benefits, known and unknown, as we make these choices. And again, I have always, you know, when I feel like vaccination is a clear and indisputable benefit, I've always recommended it. I've recommended it from 
the moment I read the press releases and the moment I read the papers in 2020. But, um, you know, when people overstep the evidence, um, when people fail to take safety seriously, uh, I'm troubled by that. And I do think that fundamentalism and zealotry in all its forms is wrong. You can be a zealot critical of vaccines and you can be a zealot proponent of vaccines. I don't think they see themselves as zealots, but there are many people who are not equipped with the uh, empirical data analysis skills to think about the different harms and risks in different age groups, and they are become a type of zealot in the other direction. They may view themselves as a good zealot combating a bad zealot or, and vice versa, but zealotry is always wrong. Fundamentalism is always wrong. Lots of medicine is gray. Lots of medicine has a, some of it has a lot of benefit and a lot more of it has a diminishing benefit, and at some point you tip over into harm. A lot of medicine has that parrot pattern and paradigm. I mean, this is not something anyone should be surprised about. This is evidence-based medicine 101. Evidence-based medicine 101. Every doctor out there will know this is how you need to think about products. The right dose, the right number of doses for a 16-year-old boy is going to be different than an 87-year-old woman back in January 2021 and back in June 2021 when we were talking about it. And that calculation is going to be very different in the fall of 2022. It's very difficult to do the calculation for the fall of 2022 because one, they're going to be bringing out this bivalent booster with no clinical data at all. I mean, they, that's what they're saying. No clinical data. Um, you know, Bob Califf and Ashish Jha have a number of threads where they talk about all the other types of data, circumstantial data that they're using. But at the end of the day, no clinical data is no clinical data. And circumstantial data is not good data. And had we had, I think, Gruber and Krauss at the FDA, the two people who resigned, go see my prior video on that, um, I think it would have been different. I think it would have been really different. And I do think that there is a hostility here. It's very difficult to discuss these issues. I got to commend somebody who I think is really, really brave and a really good person, um, Waleed Jalad, professor of medicine at the University of Pittsburgh. Follow him on Twitter. Um, why do I think he's really good? He doesn't have to <clears throat> get involved in this. You know, he, it's easier for him to step aside and let questions of myocarditis go away like so many other academics who I think they understand the issues, but they're like, it's not worth it for me to fight. This is such a polar debate. But he, to his credit, always goes back and always makes his points. He's always trying to be nuanced. He's not trying to play to one side or the other. He's trying to shoot it where he thinks the truth is. I'm trying to do the same thing. Um, but I think he's, he's, he, he does it very gracefully. And, um, and I think he's, and he and I aren't, aren't very far apart on this issue. We're not very far apart. And, uh, and that actually gives me some confidence because I know that he's a thoughtful person. And, uh, and I also know how I'm thinking about this. And uh, I'm pretty uh, emotionally very neutral about all medical products. I have no, you know, people always like, oh, do you want to hurt your feelings if some trials positive? I have no, I, I'm not on big any product team, okay? If it works, it works. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. We need to think about how to sort that out. And, you know, the same evidence you use for early treatment is, is, is a randomized controlled trial. Well done. And the same evidence you should use to mask a two-year-old is a cluster randomized control trial. Well done. And the same evidence you use to accept vaccine and boosters are well done randomized control trials. I'm the same person. I have the same rules for whoever wants to offer the product, you know, and, uh, and, uh, and this has often been a philosophy of evidence-based medicine. I remember a really nice editorial by Fontana Rosa Lundberg, I believe 1998 JAMA. This is extemporaneous, so somebody fact-check me on that. 1998 JAMA. It's called um, Alternative Medicine Meets Evidence-Based Medicine or Alternative Medicine. And it said that there is no complementary, somebody check my quote, something like paraphrasing, there is no complementary alternative medicine. There is only treatments that have been proven to benefit patients and treatments that haven't. And that happens to be, you know, some allopathic practices have been proven, some don't work, and some complementary alternative things are proven, and some and many don't work. And their point is that we really shouldn't think about it. We should think about what works and what doesn't work. And the same thing here. And you need to think about not just the need to push vaccination, but the need to do it as safely as possible. Now, somebody said, um, you know, if somebody misinterprets your figure and graph, they may walk away with the wrong message. And I said, you know, to be honest with you, I was very worried about that in 2021, that somebody may misinterpret or walk away with the wrong message. I tried to be very precise. I'm always trying to be very precise in what I'm saying. Um, and, you know, and I have a paper trail and video trail a mile long, and you can check how precise I am. But I would say that in this moment, I'm not so worried anymore because the Venn diagram of people in America who are, um, uh, who have never had the vaccine is small, okay. and, and they've never had COVID-19 either, 
okay? Uh, and they're persuadable. <laughs> like, they still are like, mm, maybe I'll make the choice. You know, that's a very small diagram. They've probably had the vaccine and had COVID-19. That's the majority. Or they've had COVID-19, they haven't had the vaccine. Or they've had the vaccine and haven't had COVID-19. I think that's the paucity. And those people will soon be in the group that also had COVID-19. These analyses are very complex branching analyses. You need to factor in all the harms of the vaccine and, vi and virus, not just myocarditis, uh, but myocarditis is a serious and important harm. You need to, um, oh, the last point I didn't make. Uh, this is the UK, you know, sort of um, uh, a population-based data set. It's not the perfect data set. You also want to pair this with EMR data sets. You want to pair this with more active surveillance. These are all passive surveillance systems. You want to do sort of blind surveillance like the um, troponin studies. We really don't have a full picture of the full iceberg. And we also want to know for the people who have myocarditis post-COVID if that's really the same thing or we're talking about the fact that somebody has a troponin leak when they're on the vent when they're really, really sick, which in which case I'm happy to concede that that person has da serious damage from COVID, but it's not technically myocarditis per se. It's maybe the, the end product of being very, very sick. That's still bad and that should be included in your calculus, but it may not be exactly the same entity as what we're dealing with here. And the other thing is we have to break it down between healthy children and sick children. Then maybe they need different booster policies and vaccine policies and by age group because a 16-year-old boy is different than an 87-year-old woman. And headlines that read, what was this headline? COVID-19 infection poses higher risk for myocarditis than vaccines. And let me read you the quote. It's something like, the overall risk of myocarditis was higher immediately after being infected with COVID-19 than weeks after vaccination for the coronavirus new research shows. The overall risk. You're lumping together 87-year-olds and 16-year-olds, 87-year-old women and 16-year-old men. Are you a real doctor? Are you a real scientist? This is the, it's the silliest thing I've ever seen in my life. And um, somebody sent me a little tweet. Let me see if I can find it here. It was kind of funny. So that's why I'm looking for it. It's called the latest reassuring byline. They circle it. Risk of heart inflammation remains lower after vaccination than after SARS-CoV-2 for most age sex groups. Oh, yeah, for most age sex groups. Well, what about the one group that we should be taking seriously? The one group, boys, between a certain age, you know, you can kind of tell who they are and maybe you'd be able to think of, I don't know, personalized medicine for those people or like not even personalized, but like things that account for basic demographics. Okay, but, you know, the other like 80-year-old people, like, don't worry. I'm like, I would never was i never was okay all right this is stupid this is really bad medical journalism um most of it is bad but that was particularly bad and um well those are my thoughts you can read this study patona and colleagues it's out now in circulation it was previously a preprint but i think the thing that they did differently now was instead of just giving sars-cov-2 um covid-19 myocarditis rates sorry myocarditis rates for people who had covid-19 um which included both people who had never been vaccinated and people who may have gotten some vaccine, they've now given a pure myocarditis post-COVID-19 for the unvaccinated. So that diffused a criticism that these comparisons weren't, weren't fair. But the right way to do it is dose one, whatever myocarditis you get from that, based on very narrow slices of demographic data, plus the breakthrough, whatever microdose you get from the break, you're going to get a breakthrough. I suspect it might be much, much lower um, uh, because I do think the vaccine will, will lower the rate of microdose once you get COVID-19 and get the breakthrough and lower the rate of bad outcomes. Uh, two doses and then the breakthrough, three doses, then the breakthrough. And if you're getting three, do uh, sorry, three doses of Moderna and then the breakthrough, it's hard for me to believe that that won't have the highest cumulative rates of adverse events, particularly in that key demographic group. I can't say for sure that that is the case because they don't have that granular data, but I think the graph you have already is showing you very, very unfavorable myocarditis from Moderna Dose 2. The U.S., had they taken it seriously, they could have done what European nations did and banned Moderna for men under 40. Kaiser Permanente in Portland, Oregon did do that, and many European nations did do that. So some people did take it seriously, and some of those people may have been influenced by by this channel so we have some small influence so that's what you get on this channel you get um a professor of epidemiology a practicing doctor giving you um his opinion on a lot of issues uh, i try to stick to the evidence and keep my focus on what matters so you know what to do if you like this channel like subscribe comment leave a message below send the video to a friend try to get the, the videos you like out there it's tough in this media ecosystem who knows what they're doing with the algorithms i'm suspicious of them but Send this to a friend and family, um, tweet it, uh, post it on Facebook, you know the rest. Uh, until next time.